My name is Brandon Enrique. I'm a visiting artist here at Group Reunion uh, and past alum. Uh, this is my great pleasure to welcome here all of you in person to tonight's talk. Thank you for joining us and thank you for well, those of us who are watching the, uh, our live stream. We are thrilled to be hosting tonight's event as part of our ongoing series for Public Art Fund Talks at the Cuba Union. It's a series organized around socially relevant, groundbreaking New York City exhibitions like the one we'll be learning about shortly. We have been collaborating with Public Art Fund going on for four years, and this is a particularly special occasion as it is, and it is not only kicking off our fall 2001 season, but also our return to gathering in person for more than a year and a half. My deepest thanks to the Public Art Fund for continuing to make this kind of programming possible at the Cooper Union. We're very grateful to partner with an organization whose work in promoting democratic access to art resonates so deeply with our own mission. Like Public Art Fund, the Cooper Union is committed to making meaningful discourse and educational forms accessible to all. Public art is a critical part of that commitment, and we are seeing it play an increasingly critical role in the life of our city. We are continuing, continuing to social distance, spending time outside, and rediscovering urban spaces as sites in which to explore artistic engagements with community, share history, solidarity against injustice with power and symbol and metaphor, and with the social possibilities for the future that art makes visible to us. Tonight's program celebrates Melvin Edwards, an artist who has, for more than 50 years, embodied that vital potential for reimagining our future. It is now my pleasure to welcome Public Art Fund's director and chief curator, Nicholas Baum, We'll introduce tonight's featured speakers. Please join me in welcoming Nicholas to the stage. The exhibition uh, is up until the end of November, so, so do catch it if you haven't already. Um, and, uh, and actually, I feel like Mel's exhibition is special for public art but in ways that we haven't even expected. Uh, it, of course, was scheduled for, well before the uh, pandemic, Thank you. 
kind of cool as well. Uh, but then Mel's exhibition opening at Google Park was our very first in-person uh, event, sort of, you know, after the lockdown of 2020. And now, so it's, it's a lovely symmetry that our first in-person tour, which we're doing hybrid, so there are people joining online as well. Is also with Mel. Mel is used to the first. He's a pioneer in many respects, uh, having, of course, been the first African American artist recorded uh, a solo exhibition. And I think, you know, perhaps even more fundamentally than that, an artist who's a place in history, as I think so important, having sort of taken the language of abstract formalism and transform that into something so much personal, social, cultural resonance and importance. And I love the fact that today uh, younger artists and curators uh, are looking at this work and finding inspiration in it. And I, I find among those my talented colleague Dan Palmer, Dr. Daniel S. Palmer, um, our uh, curator at Public Art Fund, who really has uh, seen this exhibition with Mal Champion's this work and sort of steered it through um, this sort of very unexpected course of uh, landing it at City Hall Park. So, very beautiful way. Public Art Fund has a long history with Mal. We presented his work first on Doris Green and in 1991, so 30 years later, uh, we thought, you know, fair enough, due more attention, and then so we able to present this kind of 50-year, very focused survey uh, through the motif of the chain that he has used uh, in his research model. Mel was born in 1937 uh, in Houston, Texas. He moved to New York in 1967. Um, he's been a part of that uh, dialogue and artistic milieu um, here in so many, so many different, different ways. Uh, and it's, it's really extraordinary to see how the world has sort of caught up with what we've been doing. Um, I think the, uh, the exhibition also wouldn't have happened without uh, Alex, uh, and we're great to see that you, you know, uh, for your uh, and gallery that has been you know, presenting most of the So, with uh, the we're in for a treat, um, Dan Palmer and Mel Edwards are going to join us in conversation. So, uh, please join, join me in welcoming. welcoming Brandon and um, everyone for being here tonight. Uh, everyone watching online, thank you as well. Um, we uh, have on the live stream, we have a chat available as well. And um, please add any questions that you may have um, for Mel in there on the chat. Uh, and at, for those of you in the room, we'll be passing around a microphone um, uh, in the last 15 minutes or so of the evening. Um, I want to um, echo Nicholas's thanks um, to, to everyone and especially um, say an enormous thanks to you, Mel, um, for, for being here tonight, for engaging in this conversation, and especially um, for this very special exhibition that we have on at City Hall Park um, that opened on your birthday. Um, you know, with all things sort of that uh, were in flux over the course of preparing for the show, um, it was so special to, to have a moment like that um, to open in May and to have some time on still um, for this. So um, maybe we could start by talking a little bit about the exhibition, sort of or reflecting a little bit on the exhibition. Um, I'd, I'd love to hear um, from you sort of what it's been like 
to, um, to, to bring together you know, your works in this type of way. Obviously, there have been you know, wonderful retrospectives of your, of your work and, and important exhibitions you know, of your work, but this, is, this was a sort of particular one, a kind of unique one for its outdoor and public art um, component um, and, and um, for the scope and the, and the types of works that we've brought together. So I'd love to hear um, y your thoughts on the exhibition and I'll show some images here as well at the show. Considering, handling, and taking care, taking care of my uh, work. It's a pleasure for the exhibition, the Public Art Fund, the City of New York, uh, the life that has uh, uh, allowed me to participate in for the last uh, 50 years or so. And if there's any one thing which is probably plural anyway. <laughs> but um, uh, about New York is uh, there's a lot to it. And when uh, I came to New York, I had a, an anticipated for years what New York could be like, would be like. Much of my um, art anticipation, uh, you know, people I had read about or heard about or and some I had encountered uh, on the West Coast, in Los Angeles. But uh, actually living and interacting in the space, spaces that uh, New York uh, provides, you can be very ambitious, and you can at the same time be very intimidated because New York is very dynamic in many ways. And uh, at the same time, uh, in a funny way, I've always felt comfortable in New York. Sometimes irritated and angry, but, <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's uh, life in the big city, as they would say. And, uh, but I've enjoyed that aspect. It's not the easiest place to be a sculptor. It's a painter's city as far as art con and as far as I'm concerned, you know. It's just hard. the logistics are hard. Um, uh, difficult, complicated, and moving this, and where do you put that? But that's also the history of sculpture. You know, uh, it is three-dimensional. Uh, it does have weight, and uh, it's often inconvenient. But if you reverse all of those terms, it's what gives you something that, uh, well, another way of saying it, you can get your teeth into it because it really is tangible. It's that kind of a place. Uh, the other thing is it's just symbolic uh, for somebody growing up in the United States that if you're going to make art, go see New York. And if you really feel being a part of it, it makes sense. You know, um, And New York, of course, is reinvigorated by more people every day. People come, people were already here. The thanks to the Lenin and Ape people uh, is appropriate. And uh, uh, James Fenimore Cooper, you know, uh, I'm one of those people who, when he was a boy, I read those books. Um, and when I say I read those books, what I mean, mean is it's a part of history and a part of. Uh, Whatever built the uh, deeper aesthetic foundation in me, uh, that's a part of it, you know. Um, I tend to meander when it comes to things like this, but um, this city hall in New York, city hall in Houston where I grew up, and city hall in Los Angeles, and I could have a little story about each one. I won't give those. <laughs> <laughs> we need to get the other city halls to bring, uh, bring yeah. the work there, uh, yeah? yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um. But, but uh, to be a sculptor and be in New York, uh, um, it's just feel, it's felt good. And I met sculptors before I came who lived and worked here. There was a sculptor who lived over on, uh, I think it's Green Street, but I met in Los Angeles named George Sugarman. 
and uh, uh, you know, he could see that I wanted to uh, uh, be an artist in New York. But you know, I'd heard of any number of other artists before, and so I just knew I was going to be in a world of people who really took art seriously, and I hoped they would take me and what I was trying to do seriously. And I got encouragement from the beginning. Mm -hmm. You know, I visited briefly with Jacob Lawrence, and he immediately uh, uh, welcomed me. Uh, a, a painter named Bill Majors, who was a guard at the Museum of Modern Art, but a very fine painter and etcher. But he uh, uh, told me that I should go see Hale Woodruff, who was over here at NYU. And uh, it just kept moving around person to person. And ultimately, uh, you know, while uh, my sculpture is in a material that's hard, uh, you know, but, you know, the world has always got hard and soft. And either way, you have to learn how to handle it or live with it or uh, see what it can give you. And, okay. Well, um you, you you were talking about your childhood a bit, as well as this kind of initial moment with New York City, and I just think that the the first the earliest work in the in the exhibition is a perfect um, you know slide to transition to homage to Coco from 1970. Um, you know, obviously this introduces the rocker motif that's um, present in a number of works in two works in the show, as well as it has literal chains that are you know, manifest in, in all of the, the works in the show. Um, would you speak a little bit to you know, this work as a sort of pivotal work in your, in your career, um, but also maybe you know, there's, there's beautiful, uh, I know you, you've spoken beautifully about the stories of how it relates to your childhood. And well, um, it's the, the piece is titled Coco, and that's in homage to my grandmother. Her real name, her actual name was uh, Cora Ann Anderson. Nickerson, but uh, I couldn't pronounce Cora as a little boy baby, and so it came out Coco, and uh, that was, everybody called her that for the rest of her life, but the rocking quality of the sculpture had not to do with rocking chairs and Whistler's mother and stuff like that. It really had to do with my interest in kinetic uh, dynamics in sculpture. I had... Um, uh, before I made this piece, I had worked and made function uh, the work of Jacques Tingley, uh, the uh, Swiss French uh, uh, kinetic sculptor who, of course, worked with machines. Um, and I did that work actually here in New York. Uh, but I, before that, I had worked with it in Los Angeles for uh, the Gowan Gallery. They, he'd made a body of work, left it uh, not functional, but ready, more or less ready to go, and I made it function. And, uh, uh, you know, I don't mean that that m made me think any more than seeing Calder. Calder's work also, Calder uh, actually was present in Los Angeles in around 1965. Uh, but I already knew of the existence of kinetic work. You know, I had art history like everybody, and the uh, sculptor Mohole Nagi. Uh, in other words, I had a, an idea of, the idea of movement might be interesting, but I didn't want it to be like anybody's movement that I knew of. I didn't want Calder kind of balance. It was very good stuff. Um, uh, same with Tingley, and uh, what's the other one from Europe? Uh, Buri, uh, you know. But anyway, um, and the idea of balance, and I remembered some playing that I used to do with my grandmother's rocking chair. And when I say playing, this was mission kind of furniture. And uh, there was one that didn't move and one that could rock. And so I would, when she wasn't there, <laughs> turn them over, turn them into all kinds of uh, joint things, you know, just for the look. And... Uh, once uh, played a little too roughly and ended up at the hospital because of the rocking chair. Mm. Did that make me make sculpture? No. <laughs> <laughs> but you never forgot the motion. No, but, yeah. but um, so the, the idea of the piece itself 
uh, had to do with the ideas uh, of balance in that if you just touched it a little bit, in other words, added a little bit of weight, it moved. And if it moved, uh, um, I fir the first plans for the piece had barbed wire going from side to side. But uh, after the frame was done, um, I thought that chain might be a better solution visually and uh, otherwise. And then when I moved it with the chains there, I realized the chains, because they were flexible, gave a syncopation to the ordinary pendulum balance of the rocker. So it didn't just rock and gradually settle still, but the rocking was affected by the flexible gravity of the chain. You know, so once I uh, started thinking those kind of ways, then making rockers and the idea of balance and balance based on where different parts were on different parts uh, of the pieces. So the one, and the one that's called Before Words, the other rocker, the uh, uh, rusted steel one, if you can move to that, yeah. Sure. Um, uh, that was a, uh, way that I tried to win an argument with my uh, late wife, the, Jane, uh, the poet Jane Cortez, uh, and its title is Before Words. That was because we talked about what was for human expression or capacity, the va or the value of words. And uh, uh, so I titled this piece before she ever saw it, Before Words, and then says, here I got you, you know, because <laughs> people needed to express and then they invented words. Said, well, we rock things before we knew words, you know, and uh, uh, it was an artificial argument, but art is artificial, but it g at the same time gives you things which you, uh, in any other kind of logic, might not have come up with them. In other words, uh, I could say I really don't know why I made I could s really say that about everything if you go deep enough into it. Just intuition and keep on working and feeling and finding my way, you know. But the rockers did uh, 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 um, give me the idea and ways of playing with balance. And some pieces uh, or some uh, evolved into non-rocking sculpture but they just gave me other ways of, uh, uh, if you will, manipulating the visibility or visuality of the three dimensions. Mm. I think that's very interesting also in what I see as a sort of, I don't want to say attention, but a sort of back and forth in your work between abstraction of sort of things that are kind of more formal on one side, the, the, the sort of hemi hemisphere of the, of the rocker, and things that are more of a kind of personal or recognizable iconography of forms like the chain, kind of mm -hmm. motifs that maybe a person on the street might be able to recognize. I'm, I'm curious how you see that relating to aspects of language and, and you know, abstraction. Well, um, you know, um, as writers, or people who work with words, no, one word has its meaning, but then as soon as you put a word in front of it or behind it, that meaning can be modified or changed or altogether, and the same with form. So, for instance, uh, uh, often people see change in the work. Uh, they jump to the notion of uh, slavery and that kind of history, um, when the truth is, why were chains invented in the first place? It wasn't for slavery. It was a blacksmith's way of making a stronger kind of rope, a, a metal rope, a steel rope. And so it's a, uh, the reason for it is, uh, uh, or reason, reasons plural, uh, can be many, but they're similar to why did we invent string? Mm. Why did string become rope? Why did rope become, or why did string joined together become textiles. You know, so it's just a matter of a multiple way of thinking of things. And once you um, uh, have a, a little bit of that tendency in terms of how you manipulate, then everything becomes uh, 
uh, interactive potentially. And for instance, uh, um, uh, abstraction in art and realism in art and abstraction in life and abstraction in concepts. Um, well, it's all real. All it's all <laughs> real, you know. Um, and of course, uh, uh, to abstract, to take from, uh, well, the turn of the century variant of that was changing objects uh, that we were familiar with, like still lifes or the model or things like that. But uh, reality says uh, you could have done that without bothering with the model without the, uh, you know. And so all art is abstract, you know. Only time you'll make anything real is when you make a baby. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, I mean. You, you can quote me. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm, you know, to, to, that, to that point, um, it's something that I've really noticed and loved um, about homage to Coco as well is that the the chain, you know, the the literal chain. I mean, this is chain. Uh, mm -hmm. I gather that you've got off the shelf from a hardware store or a supplier. Um, it's not all the same chain, right? There are variations well, between. Well, uh, yeah, it's it's like any line. Yeah. You know, a, a line that's a line, a chain, mm. uh, and of course it's suspended uh, equidistantly from. You know, you mm -hmm. get a more or less perfect U shape, mm. but you can suspend it other ways and uh, alter it and uh, attach things that change direction so mm. the line can change. So it can be as calligraphic as you want. Mm. It can be as static as you want. Mm -hmm. uh, in the case um, here, if it's this scale, and then in the, the uh, larger piece mm -hmm. in this exhibition, mm -hmm. the links are so large that mm. they're forms that can be Remanipulated, mm. you know, uh, they more geometricized uh, in the uh, straight line aspect, mm. but straight lines into curves. Uh, um, those are just ways I think about stuff, yeah. and at the same time, uh, you know, there's the unpredictability. Mm. You you can uh, take a handful of chains and throw them up mm. and let them drop and fall and see what kind of configuration. They happen to, mm. uh, because of uh, you know how hard they hit the surface, and what they look like, mm. and uh, whether it means something to you. Mm. In other words, you can play with form. Yeah. You can play with those things, and at the same time, you understand that what you do as a as the artist, and what people do in terms of looking at the work, can be very different. Mm -hmm can still be positive, but can simply be different. You know, the way you see, the way you interpret. Oh, sorry. Uh, are you hearing me? Uh, anyway. <laughs> no. <laughs> OK. Uh, but uh, well, well, to, to that end, Mel, mm -hmm. um, you know, I thought it would be nice to put together a slide that shows sort of uh, around the era of, mm -hmm. um, uh, of the piece of Amit Shikoko. And, you know, the, the show that, that Nicholas mentioned, you know, you were the um, first African-American sculptor to have a solo show at the Whitney. Mm -hmm. um, especially this piece, y it really is very clear how you are drawing in space in a kind of, you use the word calligraphic, mm -hmm. you know, wi with chain, um, but also that the, kin the kinetic aspect of it is sort of, Part well, of potentially, manifest. sure, yeah. sure, it's there. But uh, uh, um, the curtain, uh, which is what it's called, uh, Curtain for William and Peter, was simply, the, the titling was in homage of my two friends, the artist Peter Bradley and William T. William, uh, who were very helpful me in, to me in that period. And um, uh, in a sense, um, you know, even curtains, you know, you could say it's curtains. Well, that mm -hmm. means it's over. Mm -hmm. Or you can mm -hmm. say the curtain goes up, and now you get to see the real show. You, you know, it, it, <laughs> it, it just depends on which ways one is thinking. Mm -hmm. um, okay, but with these two materials, mm -hmm. barbed wire, it's mm -hmm. like uh, a lady saw uh, in, at the Whitney that curtain, mm -hmm. 
And immediately she responded with a relationship to the concentration tra mm. concentration camps in Germany mm -hmm. during World mm -hmm. War II. That was not a particular mm. thought of mine, mm -hmm. but uh, I was a, 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 a young man from Texas mm -hmm. who, when I went to visit my country cousins, mm. they would tease me and say, you can't even cross the barbed wire fence without tearing your <laughs> pants. And it was true. <laughs> <laughs> you know. You have to learn how to do it. Mm. But if we were going to go play on the other side yeah. of the fence, that's what we yeah. did. But the point is, is that it's a different linearity. Mm. You know? mm. And there are works that are two-dimensional, mm -hmm. which I've developed in the sense of using line, mm. and very literally using a barbed wire kind of line yeah. or a chain kind yeah. of line. Yeah. You know? And they go from hard edge straight line geometry yeah. to very flexible mm -hmm. and Mm -hmm. loose thing. Well, those are the uh, parameters or limitless parameters mm -hmm. of modern art, mm -hmm. you know, or mm -hmm. of art in general. And uh, once you sensitize to uh, uh, Chinese and Japanese calligraphy mm -hmm. or uh, Egyptian hieroglyphs, mm -hmm. and I've been to Egypt mm -hmm. and looked at them, you know, mm -hmm. uh, wasn't uh, wasn't the first time I encountered them, mm -hmm. but uh, on purpose to mm -hmm. look at those things. Mm -hmm. I didn't learn anything. I still couldn't read a hieroglyph mm -hmm. or uh, any of the words in Japanese mm -hmm. uh, written calligra in, the, in that form. But um, from first years in college, uh, the uh, Japanese brush was a part of your mm -hmm. tools mm -hmm. in Los Angeles because mm -hmm. it's community that's influenced mm. that way mm. and uh, was quite ordinary, mm. you know. Um, but how important the line is in your work mm. or juxtaposing the line against the mass, mm. you know, the uh, uh, solidity or of the uh, piece here, Some Bright Morning, that, that's the chain, yeah. the lynch fragment, yeah. well, it, it will dangle. Mm -hmm. If you will, mm -hmm. it, it dangles. Mm -hmm. You know, that's a, yeah. uh, a way to um, discuss it. I don't mm. know. Well, yeah. When when you point to to this early Lynch fragment work, it's also very interesting that, um, as I understand it, the shift from California to New York that brought about the sort of you know the kind of more environmental works and some of the larger scale works was also related to a shift away from making some of the lynch fragments for, for a moment, um, although you've continued um, to make them well, um, since. Uh, lynch fragments, say, from 63 when they started to uh, the end of 66, and I left in January of 67 mm. for New York. Mm. But that wasn't why the change in color or the focus on geometry. Um, the focus on geometry had more to do with an interest I already had in architectural dynamics. Mm. And uh, uh, those things are primarily straight edged on that. And the other thing was just simply uh, uh, focusing more on the basics of the uh, circle, the triangle, mm. the cube, etc., uh, as a way of uh, focusing in the work. Uh, because I was going larger. Mm. And larger in some ways meant to me or implied to me architecture. Mm. And architecture is big enough to contain you, mm -hmm. if not your spirit, at least you know, mm. <laughs> your body. <laughs> yeah, I, uh, that, that's a perfect transition as well to, to the image uh, you know, on the upper right, which is double circles, the piece that was mm. is still installed permanently uh, on view in Harlem. Um, and part of what you know i think we were trying to you know ad address in some regard um in in our exhibition at city hall park was the fact that first of all you've been a you know major a major a central figure in large scale public art um you know that really engages on such a thoughtful art, art historical um you know r range um and and that especially in New York City, I mean, you have four works permanently on view with you know, this piece being the earliest of them throughout New York City um, and had been just in, in you know, 
working for in that shift, um, uh, making that shift to this inv architectural scale mm -hmm. that you focused on just a second ago. Um, so, uh, you know, I'd be curious to hear, you know, and I think maybe we can sort of transition to, you know, we have an image of the promise, which sort of relates to a moment, um, you know, in the, in the mid 80s when, uh, you were also doing works, um, mid and late 80s, uh, you know, other large scale works, mm -hmm. um, including the one that actually, I have to say, introduced me to your work at, mm -hmm. at Rutgers. Uh, um, you know, education is an open, open book, book <laughs> um, which I, I went to Rutgers as an undergrad. We didn't overlap. I know you were teaching there. Um, there there's a uh, line that goes with that title. Tell me, please. If you can get them to open it <laughs> 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 when you're a teacher and you're. <laughs> oh, that's good. That's very good. Well, you got to play with it, you know. Yeah, uh, yeah. But uh, the other thing was where it cited is between the library and the, um, the student luncheon center, hall, yeah. you know, the student center yeah. and stuff. But at the, at the middle of the day, when the sun is at its highest, it uh, illuminates the, the uh, two top forms as it might a page of a book. So it's a bit about, you know, and I, I planned it so that uh, the sun, mm. it, it, because it did get moved a couple of times, yeah. but always I made sure that at, at midday yeah. it hit it that way. That's wonderful. Because I do pay attention to the larger scale works, uh, what the light might do. Yeah. And, and in works like this, you know, which are on view throughout New York City, uh, as well as other works, you know, large scale permanent public works that you have on view throughout the world, um, it's very clear that you are thinking about the site as well as the community and that these are works that really integrate into the community. I'd love it, you know, I think we'd all love to hear from you about your thoughts about your public works especially and how they fit with mm -hmm. the community. I know you've, you have some stories about mm -hmm. works yeah, there, really there, integrating. There's one that I love to tell. I'd Sorry. love to hear, yeah, okay. yeah. Uh, there's a piece in Columbus, Ohio and it's called Out of the Struggles of the Past to a Brilliant Future. The title was really the theme that the community um, chose, and they um, was a community that uh, in Columbus, the Afro-American community, that you might say functioned like Harlem in New York, but at the same time um, uh, had aged as many cities by the 1970s uh, had done. And so renovation of the community was, a, was on par. And the community decided at this complex which they were developing, there should be art to sort of celebrate that they were uh, continuing their community in a positive way. Mm -hmm. And they did a national competition handled by the National Endowment for the Arts. Mm -hmm. And they um, chose five artists we went and looked at the site each and then separately went back with our proposals. And the day I went in with my proposal, um, there was a lady who was a florist uh, in the community and she, um, uh, you know, was, somebody said, she's the important one. <laughs> if you get her, she, you'll get the commission. And so I handed her my, set of slides very hopefully and she said oh abstract stuff and I saw my slides oh, flying no. across the room <laughs> so I said well I don't have to worry about this one <laughs> <laughs> but it turned out that uh, no, my, my uh, ideas were accepted and 10 months later uh, when we are at the uh, installation uh, she was the lady showing off the most hmm. uh, at the uh, thing. But um, what the situation was there was that this community uh, was redeveloping hmm. with confidence because uh, there were questions about should you spend this much money on something that's mm -hmm. ju just art. Hmm. And it was a complex community in the sense that about 13 stories, one building, was for uh, senior citizens and people like that. Two-story uh, housing that was for families with children who were going to school. And then the small um, commercial uh, uh, facilities and uh, uh, an educational facility there. Mm. And my sculpture was sort of seated 
uh, in an area that was relatively sim central mm. to these activities. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'd get letters uh, occasionally in the first few years after the piece was there from choreographers who mm. would do dance things uh, there with the work. And in the winter, evidently, they put water in the circular mm -hmm. area and ice skated. <laughs> and so it was, it was mm. functional mm. Uh, in a variety of ways. Mm. And uh, the structure of the pieces where I addressed, mm. if you will, to some extent, the notion of the, the title were simply two large open square spaces. Mm. So it's not illustra illustrative mm. in any way. Um, except that the future is open to what we make of mm. it, if you want to uh, handle it metaphorically, mm. which is what I did. Um, the one on the right here, uh, which is uh, in Jamaica, Queens, uh, and is uh, part of the uh, what's it, social security yeah. systems. Yeah, the uh, GSA building. GSAs, right? yeah. 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 But its title is Confirmation, mm. and for two reasons. Mm. One, my respect for the uh, musician Charles Christopher Parker, or mm. Charlie Parker, mm. and a very important composition of mm. his with that title. Mm -hmm. And the other is that, you know, the Social Security Act uh, um, um, meant that for most people, or many people in the United States, after having worked in the society they live in, it's the only retirement mm. asset or basic retirement they have given back to them by their society. Mm. No questions asked. Mm. That you get, you know. Other things in other ways may say. So I thought, okay, the, the confirmation, mm. uh, this way a confirmation of a society to its people. Mm. Uh, people have already con given their confirmation by their participation mm. as human beings and citizens within the society. Mm. So uh, if you never thought of, if you never heard that Charlie Parker composition oh, yeah. and him play it, uh, you're in for a treat oh, yeah. or at least uh, an understanding of what dynamics in music uh, mm. can be. Mm. Um, and uh, and the passage, other one, uh, which is yeah, out of passage, which is, uh, um, uh, oh goodness, what's the name of the college? The Kingsborough Community, Kingsborough yeah. Community yeah. College, yeah. Um, and it's Brooklyn. one of, uh, well, both of them are in, at distance in mm. Brooklyn, mm -hmm. or that region. Oh, Queens, and Queens yeah. and then Brooklyn, yeah. Queens, I yeah, guess. Yeah, yeah, and then Brooklyn. I, I, I'm from they're, Texas. They're I both don't at the. Remember <laughs> the they're both at the at the last stop on the okay. on their subways. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> subway lines. It's a long walk from home. Okay, <laughs> but um, both of them have the um, eight foot high arch section mm. uh, in them, mm -hmm. uh, and that was sort of coincidence. But for the peace passage, mm. the idea was it's very close to the ocean, mm -hmm. and from one side. There's a section of the piece that it can uh, have the qualities of a passage mm, through. Mm. And of course, metaphorically, it's a uh, institution of higher learning and it's a important passage in one's life yeah. that one goes through. And uh, while it wasn't that way originally, they told me a couple years ago that through the years they've been using this as the site for graduation. Oh, wonderful. You know, yeah. so it's, it's so uh, appropriate. It yeah. has, yeah. It's yeah. Uh, found a use that wasn't anticipated. Well, it's, it's very interesting as well because I've always seen that arch form that you were just describing as related to the chain link form, mm -hmm. of course, mm -hmm. as well. I mean, they... Mm -hmm. they've uh, both are related to use. Absolutely. You know, Absolutely. or, or yeah. two fingers, you know. It, yeah. uh, once you start associating, associating mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that's true, yeah. you know, and... Sometimes that's helpful to me yeah. uh, in terms of thinking, and sometimes mm -hmm. uh, I'll use it like uh, a literally, uh, a, uh, what do you call it, um, a, a ruler, a ruler yeah, of a okay. curve. You know, it's got yeah. half a circle and that, yeah. you know. Yeah. It's one, uh, at least at one point they were mm -hmm. one foot in mm -hmm. uh, dimension. Mm -hmm. um, but it's just, it's, it's usable. Yeah. And in, in that sense, uh, again, metaphorically, you know, mm. the chain as a restriction and the chain as a linkage, mm. you know, and metaphorically, the chain as linkage of generations mm -hmm. of 
people. You can know, you say more? Things. Can you say a little bit more about the? Because you've spoken at length about, you know, the the multivalent, um, you know. Well, it's like metaphor. any form, uh, depending on the um, experiences people have had with the form, mm. uh, and there are many, mm -hmm. and many points of view from the same experience. Mm. You know, so uh, I. Um, you know, you could say, I'd have no problem. The more change I get my hands on, I just have more ideas. Yeah. But uh, uh, at the same time, um, I, I like to say, if you're in upstate New York, mm -hmm. it's the middle of the winter, and your car is off the road, you're very happy to see the man coming with the chains to yeah. pull your car. Yeah, yeah. You know. Yeah. Uh, and and you broken know. chains could mean that the truck, your truck weighed too much and it couldn't pull. Well, but yeah. you know, <laughs> no, but 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 also, Mel. I mean, you've you've talked. About, I think a lot of people read the broken chain, as you were alluding to before, as being about liberation and rupture from oppression, from slavery. That's and true, I think but that's it, there. But it's also the linkages that were broken. Yes. By that. Mm. So mm. Uh, once mm. you get into the metaphorical aspects, the poets have more leeway than uh, we do, yeah. because. Uh, they just, you know, it's easier to move a few words yeah. and moving a lot of pieces of sculpture. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm thinking of this one because yeah. it's not easy for people to, well, there'll be no reason for them mm -hmm. to, but it's really my height and my mm -hmm. width. Mm -hmm. You know the Leonardo da Vinci figure mm -hmm. with the their arms stretched out six feet this way yes. and six feet that way? Yes. I used to be perfect like that. <laughs> <laughs> the Vitruvian man. <laughs> <laughs> but... Uh, I just use that idea yeah. as dimensions for a set of forms, you know. Yeah. The forms are different from each other, mm -hmm. but that gave me a dynamic to play with uh, for in the composition of mm -hmm. the piece. And mm -hmm. if it were not on a um, pedestal mm -hmm. here, but actually standing, yeah. you'd find that I'm pretty much right mm. at that height. Mm. And if I stretch my arms mm. out, uh, it would be just about that mm -hmm. dimension of mm. the piece. And I made it in, uh, I guess it was 84, because mm -hmm. I was having an exhibition at uh, UNESCO mm -hmm. uh, in Paris. Mm -hmm. And so it was the, the largest mm -hmm. work that I uh, mm -hmm. shipped for that exhibition yeah. and stuff. So it, it, It's really fascinating. And maybe this is like overly technical, but um, I've been very intrigued at relationships that are kind of like material relationships in the mm -hmm. work. I mean, I think, you know, going back to the circles of double circles mm -hmm. and the half circles of homage to Coco sort of feels like there's some, there's always for, for artists, of, co of course, but especially for sculptors, there are um, like, you know, ordering materials and, you know, where you're finding mm -hmm. things and templates that you were alluding to before and whatnot. Mm -hmm. Is that something that, um, you know, that sort of, are, are these discs, you know, are there are there relationships well, in, in those types of ways that you play yeah. with, or, or, yeah? Well, all form is fair game. Yeah. You know, in other words, uh, uh, it's just a question of if what you come up with feels viable. Mm -hmm. And a lot of my decisions, no matter what uh, was planned, uh, the intuition of is it working that way, or should I alter it or, or drop it all together and uh, work with another form or set of forms. All of that's possible, you know. Um, um, you know, I, I have no reason not to change things. Now, sometimes you get in, shall we say, bureaucratic mm -hmm. situations where you have to argue with the uh, engineering department of a city or something like that about uh, what they require. Mm. Um, but most times, what they require is uh, necessary, and I'm, I don't mean that I'm against them mm. or that what I do hasn't, but sometimes uh, we have to consult back and forth enough so that they understand my intentions mm. and uh, I theirs, you know. Uh, it's just, uh, look, public art, literally means public. Mm -hmm. One of the, the best stories I have about this was when I was finishing a piece in Columbus, Ohio, and uh, a lady and uh, 
her son will come and give him. We just, it's a fairly large piece, you know. Um, um, we're just about finished. No way they would know that because I was still grinding and somebody else was working. Grind, and so this lady said, she said, hey, mister. She says, tell me. And she, she says, I live in the building here. And she had her 10 years old or so son with her. She said, um, whose monstrosity is this? <laughs> and uh, <laughs> I, I, <laughs> I said, well, she didn't know whether I was just a worker there. She didn't know I was the artist or anything. And I said, well, to tell you the truth, it's mine. She said, oh, it's very nice. <laughs> <laughs> so you can see the public is always ready. Uh, to, but one of the nicest uh, um, um, things that I ever heard about things that I'd made that were public uh, came from... Uh, Jersey City, New Jersey, and a piece of mine called Holder of the Light. And um, I was told uh, years later when I ran into somebody from that uh, community, and uh, it was an interesting day that I ran into him because it was the day Nelson Mandela was parading in lower Manhattan. And I heard somebody yell, hey, sculptor, hey, sculptor. Now, this is a crowd of people, nothing to do with art or anything. And uh, I did turn around like it ought to be me. <laughs> but it could have been anybody. But and it turned out to be a person who lived in that uh, particular project. And he said, oh, yeah, we know who you are. We really like your work. We use it on our stationery. We uh, do this, he said. And when people get married, they have their pictures taken there. They, or when people graduate from school, they have their pictures taken there. And I said, well, that's, that's a, gives me a nice feeling that there's some independent valuation of the site and the community and them coming together. And it's nothing I could have anticipated. I couldn't have made the piece bigger or thinner or thicker or anything that necessarily might have given it that idea from my point of view. So you never know, uh, you know, because... Um, the other, the opposite happens. As I'll say this because it's a, a, another sculptor, a friend of mine, uh, Richard Hunt in Chicago, but he has a piece in Harlem on 125th Street, and it's a beautiful bronze sculpture, and it's right on the uh, sidewalk, it's a broad sidewalk, so you can walk around it. But uh, at one point they were going to put it on a base, and they decided not to, I guess. And so after a year, it started to be very turquoise around the bottom. What that meant was the dogs in the neighborhood were oxidizing, <laughs> if you will. In other words, public art gets a real participation in public life. You know, <laughs> you know and uh, you know, there's no escaping it and no bit of running from it. You know, I th is it Belgium or somewhere there is uh, the famous pissing statue and something like that, you know. So it's understood, but you know that our value and uh, the realistic that uh, realism that uh, well, sometimes yes, sometimes no. Yeah. That's so it's so interesting because it's so much at the core of you know when when Nicholas was introducing you know public your your work and especially the work that we do at Public Art Fund, mm -hmm. um, you know it's something obviously we think about enormously, and it's always such a fine you know, needle to thread of oh. doing something that is really intellectually rigorous and art historically important, mm -hmm. but that um, really has has appeal to, to everyone and maybe on every different level. Um, yeah. And, you know, I, I, I put up the slide of you making work mm -hmm. uh, with Public Art Fund mm -hmm. in, in 1991 yeah. at, at Doris C. Friedman Zip Plaza yeah. Yeah. Um, at Central Park. You know, it, it, it's clear from these photos you were enjoying, you know, the, the interaction that was happening maybe of people walking by and oh, saying, yeah, well, you, you get, know. You get some funny questions, yeah. you know. Uh, sometimes I said, no, I didn't have anything. I don't know who the guy is who made this. <laughs> <laughs> what, Plausible what, deniability. I, I remember, no, a, a kind of important question once asked, and it was before a, a piece was made. I think it was the one at Kingsborough but there was a meeting somewhere in the community about sculpture. 
and um, you know the uh, information of the potential budget was flashed to the uh, audience. And um, a man said, you know, he said, look, he says, with all the difficulties and people who are hungry and problems like that, you think money like that should be spent on art? And I said, well, you could never compare art and the lives of human beings. I don't do that, you know. I said, uh, this money's been appropriated for this, you know, out of the city. And, um, uh, you know, clearly hunger has to be worked on, you know. That's the first of things with human beings. You say food, clothing, and shelter, you know. So uh, that can never, but to juxtapose those as a question, you know, then you have to say, well, does anything other than food, clothing, and shelter uh, apply to the needs of human beings? And uh, it's like all things in life, it's a balance. We have to uh, develop uh, and be creative and provide for human existence and at the same time understand that human existence has more needs than food, clothing, and shelter, you know. And so, uh, um, you know, I said, look, if the community wants to spend this money on food, clothing, and shelter, I'm fine with it. That's not an issue. I'm not saying, no, you got to make my sculpture. That, that doesn't make any sense anywhere. But at the same time, it's pretty clear from uh, all of the r records of human history that what we call art is a part of the things that we as human beings do. And it's an essential in its own way. You know? Absolutely. Um, I mean, that, that makes me think about, I mean, it was very beautiful, it was very poetic. It makes me think about you as a global citizen and, and as an artist who has worked around the world and has had art that has so profoundly connected with people around the world or has allowed people to connect with it and to connect with each other. Um, and, you know, these two pieces, but especially um, the one on the right, um, mm -hmm. you know, of Ko Ido, um, sort of evokes some of your travels and, and work and maybe influences uh, from different regions and dialogues mm, in that way. Uh, Ko Edo is uh, the Edo way, meaning the way of the people of Benin, you know. Um, and, of course, it's really plural, not singular like that. But uh, because I've spent a significant amount of time there in Benin, um, um, the previous Oba of Benin, uh, on one of my visits, I presented him with one of my small uh, hanging pieces, you, you know, and stuff. And um, when, um, through the years, I've had one of the, his son, who is now the Oba of Benin, Oba Ewari II, he was actually a graduate student at Rutgers. Not a student of mine, but uh, I knew him because I, knew people, you know, related to him and his family. And he did visit my studio once, uh, which was uh, uh, very meaningful to me. And it was the uh, piece that uh, was for Columbus, for Ohio. And uh, he uh, liked it very much, you know. And at a certain point, I gave him, of course, a small piece of mine. But here is a community where the artists have been casting bronze since the 800s, you know, before the back in that community. And the big question, which shouldn't be a question, and that is uh, give the art that was taken from Benin and other African places, just give it back. Yeah. You know, don't argue about uh, can they keep it in a nice house or something or like that, but it's, it belongs there. Yeah. And, um, um, uh, I happened to watch a, a program on television recently and seeing him who studied um, um, what is it, urban uh, development in his master's degree program and was aware, uh, as you can be, of you know, realities in the world. And at the same time, here he is with an ancient kingdom inside of a modern nation, you know, there are about four different kingdoms actually mm -hmm. existing inside of Nigeria 
as Nigeria, but they really have long histories of different kinds. Uh, but in any case, uh, uh, I first went there in 1971 and uh, got lucky and got to meet uh, Oba, the Oba of that period, Akinzua, and uh, so the, the three Obas of the last 50 years, I just happened to uh, get to know a little bit. And um, to when I say that, they all were aware of their culture, hyper aware, and their culture is alive. That is, those, m many of them, not all, but many of them are explicitly family religious uh, articles. And uh, they still cast as finely as they did, you know. Of course, some casters are better than others. What, what's new in the world, you know? But um, uh, it just gave me, uh, when I encountered that particular, and I encountered others, but that particular one was such a clear example of continuity, you know, and of culture, and of human values, you know, and uh, of families, if you will, you know. And then, of course, different ways to organize countries, you know, from the days of bows and arrows to uh, rockets, you know, you know, you know, it's all there and it's here and, and we're all susceptible to the positives and the negatives of those realities. I mean, speaking to the negatives and obviously catastrophic disruptions of lineage and traditions, you know, this, the site at City Hall Park mm -hmm. um, is a site of, you know, that's intertwined with New York City's history of, mm -hmm. and the America, United States of America's history of slavery. You know, it is proximate, overlapping with the African burial ground. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I'm curious to hear your thoughts about how, you know, works like this and just generally sort of working at that site um, maybe added an additional resonance to the work or to the context. And then obviously there's the discussions of, you know, Occupy City Hall and the protests, the Black Lives Matter protests of the last years and the movement for social justice and how this sort of um, became intertwined with the story uh, of the exhibition and of, of the moment of that, that people were partly seeing the work through that lens, perhaps. Um, um, not that that's the only lens, no, obviously, no, for the work. Yeah. I don't know, um, um, put it like this. The views and the thoughts related to any art, especially public art, art that has a public presence, uh, are going to be complex. Complex primarily based on what's going on within the society at the time. And, you know, American society is not a passive, uh, it's a dynamic reality. Uh, everything, any uh, movement you mentioned and didn't mention has happened in New York. Okay. City Hall represents the city. So why wouldn't protests be there? You know, why wouldn't uh, uh, good legislation come from there? Why wouldn't bad legislation <laughs> come from there? Well, I'm just, I'm trying to say that uh, being realistic, all of those are true. Everything is true, um, but then uh, the simple idea that hopefully what we do with our lives uh, will be positive, creative, and helpful for a better future, you know. And that doesn't stop with New York City. That stops with life on Earth. You know, you, wait, you can use your life as you like being here, you know. But um, I, I will say in terms of my own awareness, uh, having seen grandparents and, you know, uh, lucky because some people don't get to know their grandparents, things like that. But seeing my grandparents and their various uh, struggles and realities, uh, their happiness were this or that, um, um, their disappointment because human progress is not gone fast enough, you know, 
that we haven't made education easier for everybody to have, you know, uh, things like that. And they discuss it, you know, they, they talk about it. Why can't every, if you can know you're gonna have an industrial society and you create new art, new architecture, and you uh, create public education so that people will be able to work in these new industries, and now we're in a computer era, and you uh, now charge more for education, like it's really a money gift to creditors as opposed to making education free for everybody. That would be the most creative thing you can do for this society and for all human societies because if you make uh, uh, growth, uh, growth and development uh, convenient in a society, you automatically will imp have an improved society. And that's real creativity. If we talk about aesthetics, you know, or use the term, then certainly, uh, you know, an awareness of the aesthetic values of an improved life mm. through art, culture, education, mm. science, technology. That's why I like the United Nations idea, mm. and in particular UNESCO, mm. which is education, science, and culture. Mm. You know, I think, uh, um, and I like the idea that if human beings can create that at that level, then everybody can participate uh, at some level that ultimately is beneficial for all of us, you know. We'll still have headaches. <laughs> <laughs> Always. Yeah. Um, maybe to start to bring things towards wrapping up and, and, and starting to expand it out to the, the conversation with the audience, so think about questions, all of you out there. Um, you know, the, the most contemporary piece in the exhibition is Song of the Broken Chains, which mm -hmm. was, you know, n newly made, um, you know, to, to show on the scale at this mm -hmm. exhibition for the show. Um, you know, this really feels like it answers some of what you were just speaking to, especially in terms of, you know, this site, this moment, you really were able to, I think that this feels to me like the, you know, the sort of the rising crescendo, the kind of climax of the, of the exhibition in terms of if there are works from 1970, you know, to 2020. Um, you know, could you speak to sort of making work in this current, you know, moment, um, especially with that cultural aspect being one that I think has just been so complex and contentious in this moment? And I think I, I, I've at least heard in terms of the overwhelmingly positive response to this exhibition, you know, that seeing a work like this, which really, you know, speaks in a monumental, you know, register um, in the moment where we're reconsidering public space and monuments and things like this, mm -hmm. um, you know, really, uh, yeah, is, a, is a, a, a very clear, crystal clear song, mm -hmm. if this is the song of the Broken Chains. Yeah, yeah. well, um, Playing with the chains, you know, that is um, uh, considering various possibilities in how the forms can be manipulated and still uh, uh, have the feeling of having come from the original idea of chains. Um, I mean, the structural uh, idea. Uh, and then um, playing with the implications because people do. There's no way that human beings aren't going to think a variety of what is the meaning of this, or they'll tell me what the meaning of it <laughs> is, uh, uh, all of that. But the piece, uh, um, I've drawn variants of that kind mm. of idea many times, and they ultimately are an evolution of the vertical mm. piece called the column of memory yeah. uh, variant of the chains, you mm -hmm. know, and they are even with that one or with that one, there are you know, positive aspects mm. that some people perceive mm. and others say, oh, well, chains again? Come on, mm. Mel, you know. Uh, when are you gonna, you know? But um, uh, all I can say is, if you keep working with ideas and mm. their thematic possibilities, you'd find other ways of developing. And I had made a smaller version, mm -hmm. uh, actually in Sao Paulo, mm. 
uh, which is and developed pretty explicitly this idea, right. and um, but smaller, of course, and ultimately in a mild steel or mm -hmm. carbon steel. Um, but I thought it ought to be bigger, mm. and uh, so uh, we worked on it, mm. and my uh, fabricator Tony Jones in mm -hmm. Trenton, uh, mm -hmm. who's been very good to work with, um, he worked on a piece for me which is in San Diego. Mm -hmm. uh, um, it was, uh, there's a walkway dedicated to the uh, works of Martin Luther King mm. and, and uh, with uh, his words in bronze mm -hmm. along a long mm -hmm. walkway. And so I, there in the mid 90s, I made a what, 20 foot high, 30 feet across mm. stainless steel. And in p inside of part of it, was a column of, mm -hmm. uh, of chain. Mm. But anyway, but the promenade mm -hmm. was all of these works of Martin Luther King. And one of, the, uh, one of them said, um, we must uh, eliminate the chains of hate and emphasize mm. the ethics of love, mm. you know, or something, I'm paraphrasing, mm -hmm. but uh, something to that e uh, extent. And um, uh, I said, well, he's got uh, a, a very nice reference to uh, kind of form that I use all the time. So mm -hmm. if I can do something decent, and uh, luckily uh, they selected the uh, the idea mm -hmm. that I had, and so it's there in San Diego. Now I'm working on another one in uh, Los Angeles. Uh, not again the same form, but there are chains mm -hmm. in it. Mm -hmm. You know, in fact, more maybe than the others. But coming back to this one, mm -hmm. it just means there are variants. Variants on the ideas, mm. you know, ideas plural, mm. um, and therefore the structural possibilities or the sculptural possibilities, mm. uh, you know, and just by turn, twist mm. that. But that's what a, a, a very fine dance is, turns, mm. twists, mm. different positions, but it's still the same basic form, the mm. human body, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. So why not with other kinds of form you can't work out uh, mm. uh, things like that. Mm. There's another one, uh, because one of my, uh, my ambitions, mm. if you will, is I would love to have uh, a major piece s relatively thematically similar to these works in all of the ports mm. uh, uh, in the world mm. where things have been changed by the presence mm -hmm. We were brought from Africa, mm. not to make art for the ports <laughs> of mm. the city, but to help develop mm. this world that we're in. Um, and in that process, which has a lot of uh, aspects to it, the world also has changed a lot technically mm. and philosophically mm. in the last 500 mm. years. Well, at this point, why not acknowledge mm. that contributions have come in every society in the world from people from other societies? Mm -hmm. When the, the things that are in the newspapers now about immigrants, mm. what world is, what place is there in the world mm. that people didn't immigrate to at one point or another? Mm. Well, you know, what place is there? There is no mm. such place. You know, and what that means in aesthetic, artistic terms mm. is aesthetics and artistic qualities have come from everywhere and enhanced every place. Mm. You know, we may not always identify it, you know, a, as such, mm. but nevertheless, that's a reality. And I think it's just such a perfect reality, you know, to, to emphasize at a place like, you know, Lower Manhattan, New uh -huh. York City in this well, moment. Well, we're New Yorkers, okay. Yeah. <laughs> you <know>. <laughs> Come <laughs> from everywhere. Okay, yeah. great. So, yeah. so let's, um, let's take some audience questions, if oh. that's all right. Great. And I'll just put up this final view, this final slide. Um, Katerina has a microphone that we can pass around, and, and maybe some have come in uh, over, the, um, over the live stream as well. Any questions in the room? Anyone? I can start with a question. Oh, we have questions in the audience. Great, great. <laughs> Thank you. 
Thank you so much. I live right across from City Hall Park, so I walk through this exhibition on a daily basis, and Lucky it's been you. an absolute pleasure to live with these uh, works for the last few months. My question is about your use of metal, and I wonder if you could speak a little bit about that. I loved when you were speaking about the connections um, and continuity across time and place. It was back to the Benin bronzes, and then also looking forward to uh, technological innovations with uses of metal. And I wonder if you could just speak to what drew you to steel, what drew you to metal in general in your practice as a sculptor? Um, well, let's go back. Uh, um, basically, um, I saw somebody welding, another, another art student. And steel is the commonest material uh, out there. Actually, ex uh, I don't know that maybe plastic has gotten to be more common than steel now, but in the world that we live in, it's that common, you know. So uh, we're used to it even when we don't know it's what we're using. Uh, but um, I didn't choose it over other materials. It just was my first welding lessons were in steel, and I kept going in it. And uh, I did try uh, uh, to use aluminum and uh, didn't like it. I just simply didn't, you know, no. Uh, it, it didn't have the right feel for me, but that was personal because I knew other people who handled it quite well. Um, and uh, I uh, just didn't do enough spend enough time with possibilities of casting in bronze. I did some, uh, there, there's, I have a, a little welded piece of bronze that I made in 1963 or so. And, uh, you know, it, it, it's nice, but it wasn't, you know, just wasn't, uh, it didn't take with me. I, I don't know how to say it, but you know, some people like coffee and some people like tea. <laughs> it's a bond like that. You know, and um, uh, I'm trying to think if there's another material. Um, I, I uh, every now and then I think, well, I, I didn't. I've never spent any time carving wood, um, but um, and I was given a beautiful set of carving tools by a, uh, a great uh, senior. Uh, wood carving, African carver from in Ghana, Nana Ose Bonsu, who was in his 70s. And I showed him um, uh, photos of my work. And he just said, oh, steel, beautiful. And he took me to visit a traditional blacksmith. You know, uh, for those who believe in uh, family heredity, they say in my family, the, uh, in my mother's side of the family, as far back as we can go, there was a young adult uh, African brought uh, uh, and sold in one of the ports of New York to a family who then moved him to Alabama. The family name is Felton. And uh, he was already a young adult trained in metalwork. I didn't know that, anything about that. So I can't say, you know, that kind of thing. But that's, uh, I found that out in the uh, mid-70s. And my, grandma, my mother got that information from one of her uncles. And when he told her that, she said, oh, well, that's what my son Mel does, you know. So, uh, but in terms of, I could work in the other materials. You know, I, I don't have anything, I don't have time enough. That's another issue. But, uh, uh, and every now and then, uh, I outline some things uh, to happen in other uh, materials. But I probably I'm used to it as the most direct way of working. It's like, why do you, if you got to write a letter, why do you do it on paper? <laughs> you know, and why do you use a pencil or a pen? Well, by now it's convenient. Are there, is there another question in the room? Oh, there's a bunch of more. Great, yeah.
Thank you for this. Um, I, I loved what you said about words before, that they change according to, what, to the words that you put before or after. Mm -hmm. And that made me think about space and location as well. And I was wondering if you are happier or maybe more satisfied when a work of art of yours is indoors or if it outdoors and if it changes, if it's, you know, inside a building or outside of it, mm. what do you prefer more and why? And thank you so much. Um, some works uh, both are of size and quality that they just feel right outside. Um, most of my work is, if I'm going by numbers, um, uh, tends to be what I call the appropriate scale for inside r or size, you know. And uh, they just seem, you, if I get too far away from them, which is what outside tends to mean, you don't get the, to fully appreciate what they are. You need to be close, in other words. Um, and even uh, taking into consideration for the pieces of mine that hang on the wall, uh, I said years ago that they should be 69 inches from the floor to the hole in the back where they suspend. And the reason for that is at that time, my exact eye level was 69 inches above the floor. This is my work, it's my eye, so you see it uh, at that <laughs> level. Um, and um, uh, I laughed at myself, but I, d I did say, you know, uh, when I came up with that notion, but I said, well, but that's a logic. And humans have used, you know, the, the, the size of your thumb being an inch or, you know, uh, a foot being a foot, though most people's feet aren't a foot. <laughs> and some of my relatives are bigger. <laughs> you know, but what I'm getting at is uh, you just go by your feeling. And in some pieces, I do make specifically to be outside. I mean, this piece, that's definitely for outside. But a smaller version of it uh, could easily be m more logical inside, you see. So it just, uh, it's relative to the situation, you know. Yeah. Great. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe we have time for one or one more question. Time. Let's see. Yeah. Great, yes. Hi, Mel. Uh, Hi, Mel. Hi, Dan. Thank you for such a great conversation. Um, I was curious to hear a little bit more. I love how you both talked about how the work functions in the public environment. And that made me sort of start to think about how you were talking about some of the phenomenological aspects of how you create your work, Mel, from the, the most recent work in the exhibition here to the work in the 80s where, you know, you're thinking about light as reflected off the work to even something like double circles that's kind of refracting some of the colors of some of the circles next to the other circles to the mm -hmm. movement that you're, um, you know, kind of inst instilling in the work and how that might translate to some of, you know, the way that the public is receiving or interacting with, with the work outside. Um, with double circle, uh, there's something which you can't see, um, but it's um, uh, two circles are silver and two are yellow. And what I really wanted, but the money wasn't there for the project, is the two that are silver, I wanted them to be stainless steel. Mm. And that they would be polished in a way that not reflect, but refracted uh, the color, you know, uh, opposite them. And so if you, and sometimes photographically, it worked out anyway, if the light was right. But that if looking for one direction, you would actually see three yellows because of refraction and uh, one silver. And looking from the other way, you would see three silvers, uh, you know, or at least an altered yellow based on, again, the light and the light bouncing from one part to another. And um, if you will, my approach to painted sculpture, uh, I got a bit serious about it starting in 1968. I was in, spent the summer in Minneapolis and, um, and while there, uh, uh, 
did about a half a dozen pieces in, in a month's time. And it was the first time that I had seriously experimented with uh, color and sculpture and geometry, you could say, or geometric form. Um, and uh, from that, several things happened. I, I've worked with a, a group of artists, uh, William Williams and Guy Chacha uh, in New York, and we painted walls at the end of that summer. So uh, in Harlem, and now people are discussing that and making comparisons to mural painting. And uh, what I had to make clear to people in relation to that, we were not painting murals because murals address issues illustratively. Uh, uh, we were painting walls and murals are wall painting, but we were changing, not telling people to change the world, but actually changing it by what we did, if you will, if you understand the difference. In other words, if you change the visual appearance of a community, you've changed it, you know. Now, if you want to tell them to believe in uh, this kind of change, that kind of change, or do it fast or slow, or that kind of thing, that's an a, a additional uh, aspect you can put in the work. We chose to deal directly with the idea of change in what I really wanted, and, and we wanted, uh, I can say it that way, was we wished we had the opportunity to build an absolutely new city or society and really construct it the way we would that would be positive. There are some cities that are pretty directly built like Brasilia and Brazil, you know, uh, and that concept. And I knew about that kind of concept and would love to see, you know, 500 variations of people exploring that kind of thing these days instead of just another set of houses added on to uh, uh, communities and extending the size and uh, size of cities and just making them more di difficult, you know. Um, in other words, just like you can make new art, we can create new cities, we can create new uh, regions and develop them, you know. But we have to, as human beings, think more cooperatively, you know. And if, if art has taught me anything, uh, you know, it's that, no, you can start from scratch and create something uh, very good. Doesn't mean it will be perfect. You may need changes, you know, or the environment may change and you may have to change because of that. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, if you have the confidence uh, in yourself, and uh, that is yourself as a society, to do that, then you can do it, you know. And, um, you, you know, You get what I'm getting at. <laughs> well, well, Mel, we, we certainly appreciate you changing the environment of, of Lower Manhattan for the, uh, the duration of the exhibition and for, for all of your incredible work throughout, throughout the city and throughout the world. Um, and thank you especially for, for this thoughtful and, and wide-ranging conversation tonight. It's been an honor to, be, to work with you and to be in dialogue, and I know everyone here is thrilled to have experienced Thank you, Daniel, Thank you. for uh, you and the Art Fund for, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> uh, our fund there's funding. Water. There's water. <coughs> oh, that's right. It's even mine. Well, we want to make sure we give you the last word, Mel. <laughs> the cough, a cough cannot be the last word. This interested in art, um, uh, you know, and all of my. Uh, fellow artists, colleagues, people who make art and participate in this uh, uh, combination of 
ideas and ways of uh, looking at the world and creating and hopefully helping it to be a little better. Um, because um, I do think uh, the people who uh, were my teachers or my friends and uh, people who participate in these arts, you know, because they're important. You know, and they certainly uh, added to the quality of my life. Thank you. Thank you.